I was led by God to teach from this story. It's the story of David, when David as a king was having a lot of problems. How many of you know that you could be a king and still have problems? Like you could be at the top of your game and still have problems. And I'm gonna read the story for, to you from when David was at the bottom he was at the bottom, like literally on the ground. He had so many problems in his family. He had just committed adultery. The, the woman with, with whom which he committed adultery got pregnant. The baby that they had together is very sick. And let me read to you the story. And from this point, you can't go any lower. And I think it's good sometimes how the Bible just shows us that God's okay with talking about men and women in the Bible who've gone low. But sometimes you've got to go low before you can get resurrected. So don't give up. I said, don't give up. Don't give up. I'm going to read this story. It says in verse 18, it says, then on the seventh day, the child died. David advisors were afraid to tell him. He wouldn't listen to reason while the child was ill. They said, what drastic thing will he do when we tell him the child is dead? When David saw them whispering, he realized what had happened. Is the child dead, he asked? Yes, they replied. He is dead. Verse 20, then David got up from the ground, washed himself, put on lotions, another translation says, anointed himself, changed his clothes, went to the tabernacle, or went to the house of the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord. And after that, he returned to the palace and was served food, and he ate. You may be seated today. I want to begin by sharing this with you, that the size of your problem usually is an indicator of the size of your promotion. I hope that encourages you, because when you understand the power of problems, you realize problems don't come into your life just because. There's always a strategy. Problems come with an assignment. They're assigned to you. They're assigned to help you. Problems come into our life to build us, to train us, to humble us, to disciple us, but ultimately to transform us. Don't be intimidated by the size of your problem. Believe me when I tell you that the size of your problem, whether it's financial, physical, relational, spiritual, whatever it is, the size of your problem is an indicator of the size of the promotion that God has assigned to you. <laughs> problems lead you to a process. In other words, problems take you somewhere. I know everybody wants their miracle, but let me explain this to you. A caterpillar doesn't need a miracle. A caterpillar needs a process to become a butterfly. And sometimes we just want the miracle, but we don't want the process. How many of you are in a process right now? I've never met someone that did anything great for God that didn't go through a hard process. So let me say this to you. The greater you desire for God to use you, the greater the problems God's going to allow you to be processed through. And the reason why, you can't write anyone's prescription if you don't understand their pain. And sometimes God needs you to understand the pain of the people that you've been called to liberate. Because if you don't know people's pain, how could you set them free? But I'm preaching to a church that knows that God has declared, let my people go. How are you going to set people free if you didn't understand bondage? How are you going to heal someone if you've never been hurt? How could you say God is good if you don't know what it is to be bad? Come on, church. God's looking to resurrect someone from the dirt. David had to go through a process. Problems come with an assignment. Problems lead you to a process, but a process will always refine your praise. See, when you see people praising, like you come to freedom and we're shouting, we're singing, we're jumping, and you hear people say like, 
God is good, hallelujah. And you wonder, why do they say those things? It's because when you've come up from pain, pain changes your vocabulary. And when you get to know the presence of God in the midst of your pain, you don't just say hallelujah. You say hallelujah, thank you Jesus, God is good. I should have died, but I'm still alive. I shouldn't have made it through this, but oh God, look what the Lord has done. Unless you know what it is to be at the end of your rope, you don't know how you're going to pay the mortgage, you don't know how you're going to pay for your kids, school tuition, but all of a sudden you get on your knees and in the midst of that pain, you go into God's presence, your vocabulary will change, your words will change, you'll start saying like this, he is faithful, he is faithful, he is faithful, he is faithful, I've come to testify, God has been faithful, God has been faithful, God has been faithful. Has it been hard? Yes, but he is faithful. He is a good God. I need someone for the next 10 seconds to just give our God praise. Come on, church. Come on, balcony. I know God's been good to you. If God set you free, if God broke you out, when you know you shouldn't have the favor on your life. See, when I see Pastor Dwayne up here, breaks my heart because I see a man of God, a man who's been seasoned by life. I've been coming to church. I drive from San Diego here. When you see me here at church with you guys, it takes me two hours to get to church. Come on, somebody. But how many of you know a church alive is worth the drive? Hey, 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 people. Every time I see him come and he ministers at tithes and offerings, I say, my God, that is a man of God who has stood the test of time. It's beautiful to see someone with such maturity and grace come and let us know that God is faithful when we give. God is faithful when you tithe. God is faithful. So can we give Pastor a big round of applause? Let's honor the man of God. Come on, Pastor, stand up. Let us... Give us the privilege to honor you today. We love you. We honor you. We thank God for you. Thank you for not giving up. Thank you for not giving in. Thank you for trusting God. Come on, give it up for Pastor Dwayne. I love you. Would you see this in your notes? Number one. God desires to be praised and worshiped in the midst of your pain and problems. This is what God desires. God, he's not pleased when he sees us go through pain, but he desires that we bring him our pain through praise. Look at what the Bible says in Psalms 156. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. In other words, everything in your life Bring it to God so it could praise God. So when you come to church and you've got problems, let those problems praise God. When you come to church and you've had situations that are hard, let that praise the Lord. Let what happened to you praise the Lord. Let what they're saying to you praise the Lord. Let what the devil try to do to you praise the Lord. Why? Because look where you are. You're in the house of God and you're still praising the Lord. That's what God desires. That's what God desires. I know for some of you, you barely got here today and you feel like, well, I just made it, but I want you to know the fact that you're here is praising God. It's saying God was worth the drive. God was worth the inconvenience of getting up in the morning. That's what he desires. The Bible says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. God says, I want all the earth to worship me. You know, even plants, if you plant a plant in the part of your house that's very shade, where there's a lot of shade, you come back three months later, you will find that that plant will find a way to move towards the sun. Because even plants, creation, worship God. Jesus is so passionate about being worshiped. 
And God is so passionate that he said in Luke 19, 39, some of the Pharisees from the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples for shouting these praises. And Jesus replied, I tell you, if these people keep silent, the stones will cry out in praise. In other words, he knows. If you're not going to praise me, I will say to these stones, I need you to praise me. I will say to the a cave, you're going to praise me. I will say to the dust, the dirt, what I, come on church. We're not going to let a stone out praise us. This is what God desires that he even said to the Pharisees. If you guys don't praise me, that's okay. These stones will. You can learn a lot from a person by what they do when they face painful and difficult situations. What you're going through right now is bigger than you. I know what you're going through seems like no one understands. And you're right. How can we? It's your pain. It's your problem. But it's also your decision. David made a decision. And today I want you to read the story of another man who went through a lot of pain. Had a big problem that happened to him. Read it with me from Job chapter 1 verse 19. A windstorm from the desert blew the house down, crushing all of your children. I am the only one who, is, who escaped to tell you. When Job heard this, he tore his clothes, shaved his head because of this great sorrow. He knelt on the ground, then worshiped God. We bring nothing at birth. We take nothing with us at death. The Lord alone gives and takes. Praise the name of the Lord. In spite of everything, Job did not sin or accuse God of doing wrong. Let me explain this to you. Job was the wealthiest man on earth. He had everything. He had a wonderful family. He had a thriving business. But then one day Satan said to God, you're so good to him. Why don't you test him? and see if he'll serve you, if you take everything away. He even said to God, will a man serve God for nothing? In other words, will someone serve you and they get no benefit from it? Will someone really serve you? And what he was saying is, of course, he's gonna serve you. Look at his house, look at his children, look at his family, look at his wealth. Who wouldn't serve you? And he says, take it all away, and I bet you he won't serve you. And God said, you're serious. He said, okay, because he knew Job, just like he knows you. He knows you. Man, I'm gonna say this, and I hope, I hope you can hear my heart in this. Whenever you go through a painful situation, know this, God is trusting you with that pain. As a pastor, Sometimes we hear things that we can't understand, like how does a baby die in a mother's stomach and she has to give birth to it and she's been waiting to have a child, but as soon as she has her child, it dies before it can come out and bless the family. What do you say to a family that experiences that? It's hard to say to a wife who has children and the husband just disappears, doesn't ever come back. They're faithful, love God, but why is this happening? I've had to learn over the years of pastoring, sometimes the only thing I could say is, I need you to trust that God is trusting you with this pain. He doesn't give this kind of pain to everyone. Job was tested. And at the very end, when Satan went after everything, have you ever felt like the devil was after you? Like, oh my gosh, like you pray, you read, but the more you pray, the more you read, the more spiritual warfare you have. <laughs> have you ever felt like you're the crazy one in the family because you're the only one that's forgiving, the only one that's believing, and everyone else doesn't care, and you're wondering, why do I have to go through all this? I've come to tell you, you're not crazy, you're just called. You're not crazy. You're just called. You're not crazy. You're just called. I know it seems like you're crazy because you're the only one. And it's in those moments 
that God is looking at you and he's saying this, oh, go ahead, I know who they are. And you feel like, God, I'm going through this test, where are you? Well, you know what I've learned? The teacher is always quiet during the test. God, where are you? I'm doubling up on my prayer. I'm doubling up in the word. And it just seems like I don't know where you are. I can't see you and I can't hear you. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. Thank God that we get the testimony after the test. Give me the test, but I want the testimony. Give me the test, I want the testimony. Look what the Lord has done. The devil tried to kill my family, but my 15-year-old daughter is preaching behind the pulpit. No! Come on, church. Had I not experienced loss, I wouldn't have known humility. Had I not experienced deep pain, I would have never known his perfect peace. Had I not experienced rejection, I would have never known the power of his righteousness. Oh, had I not known loneliness, I would have never known the depths of his love. Had I not known the fear of the future, I would have never known that his that his favor is incomprehensible. His favor is undeniable. His favor cannot be stopped. Come on, somebody. And that the love affair that God has is between you and him, and he will love you unconditionally. Come on, somebody. I don't like what I'm going through, but I like what I'm becoming as a result. Come on, somebody. This is what Job went through because God desires to be praised in worship in the midst of your pain and problem. Number two, God desires to turn your problem into your greatest promotion. I've had the privilege to meet people over the years of being a pastor and traveling around the world. I know what it is to be in the White House and to speak at Capitol Hill. I'll never forget when I was asked to speak for the DREAM Act. And as a Latino, that was a huge honor to know that my parents who came from Mexico, uh, to believe for their family to have a greater life, to sit there on Capitol Hill, on CNN, and talk about the power of a dream. Let me explain this to you though. Most people only see that part of the Instagram, but they don't see the pain that it took to have that promotion. Eventually, you're gonna have to make a decision. I don't know when, but you will. You're gonna have to make a decision. I'm either gonna let this problem become my promotion, or this problem is gonna be the very thing that punishes my future. And I believe this today. I believe that when we turn our heart to scripture, and you let the Bible be the last word in your life, not what the doctor said, not what the lawyer said, not what they said, not what she said, not what he said, and not what they're still trying to say. Oh, let me explain this to you. I'm gonna say this. There will come a time in your life where you feel like everyone is against you. People that you love, people that you serve, people that you built, people that you helped, and you're gonna ask yourself, why are all these people forgetting that the good that I've done for them? That's the plan of God. Whenever you're mistreated by people who you've loved deeply, heads up, that's a test. Whenever people who you gave your life for won't stand behind you for a minute, that's a test. Never underestimate the problem that you're experiencing right now. You might see it's the end, but God sees it could be your beginning. I'm preaching to somebody today. 
I'm preaching to someone who's about to have a resurrection. Yes, they killed you, but God's going to resurrect you. Yes, they crucified you. Yes, they buried you, but God's going to resurrect you. Come on, somebody. That's why the Bible teaches this. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. When you love God through your pain, everything works in your good. Okay, let me really sad tell you this. It really does. Anyone that has had loss knows this. You can lose so much in life that the memories of your past are so painful that you can't even think about a better future. And when your memories are greater than your dreams, it's like you're stuck in a time warp. And people tell you, oh, just get over it. <laughs> really? <laughs> Have you ever had someone just tell you that? Oh, just get over it. Really? You just, you just get over it. <laughs> Everything. Everything. I've come to testify to you. Everything really does work for your good. If you can hang in there. I want to read Job 42.10. This is how his story ended. The Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. Come on, somebody. We started in Job chapter 1. We finished in Job 42. Somebody say 42. Say 42. You may be stuck in Job chapter 22 of your life, but don't give up. Chapter 42 is on its way. Dad, I'm preaching for you today. You may be in Job chapter 30. Don't give up. Chapter 42 is on its way. I know you can't see it. I know you may not know it, but God is writing the story. And at the end of Job's life, the devil had to pay him back twice for everything that he did. Come on, somebody. Job 42. Somebody say, 42. It's powerful. It's powerful. When I tell you that God desires to turn your problem into your greatest promotion, I'm not joking. I am not joking. It may be different, but it's going to be better. I don't know what happened to Job. It was different but it was more better, more better, more better. I know it's not good English, but y'all know what I'm saying. It's gonna get better because until the story is done, you ain't done until God says it's done. You're not done until the story is better than your past. Oh, I'm serious. God is gangster like that. No, listen. God is gangster like that. Can you allow me to be vulnerable for a minute with you? The reason why I want you to register for the prosperity conference is for this reason. Until you've lost more than a million, you won't understand the power of comeback. Last year, I lost close to $2 million in one day. Horrible. And more, actually. I never, I worked 25 years to build my wealth for my family. I made some bad decisions in my life years ago that I had to come clean with, and it cost me millions of dollars. When you hear these people on television that lose money, and you're like, ah, he's wealthy, he'll get it back. No, homie. No. You lose 100 bucks and it hurts, bro. Okay? So I'm going to be very transparent with you. I, I'm not trying to impress you, but I want to impress upon you. I know what God is. I know what it is to lose everything. And to realize 
I have no job. I have no income. I have a little bit of income, but not nothing to sustain my life. And I'll never forget when God gave me this word about Job 42. If you follow me on Instagram, I wear this hat and this whole campaign on my podcast called The Road to Restoration. I talk about it. How God gave me a revelation and said, Sergio, if you'll praise me through this pain and problem, I will restore back to you what you never thought you could have. Okay, let me explain this to you. I'm about to go in. The reason why you need to go to the prosperity conference is because when you lose, it does something to you psychologically. It damages your spirit. It wounds your self-worth and your self-confidence as a man. But when you get around people like Bill Winston and Benny Perez and Tim Story, Pastor Jason Lozano, come on somebody, Dr. Chris Hill, let me tell you why. These guys have lost a lot. They're my friends, I know what they've lost. But to see these guys where they are today, I understand now. In one year, I lost everything. I started a company, and in the first year, I was able to buy my dream home. I've never shared this, but I'm being open with you because I was living in the one bedroom of my daughter's house, which was my home, which they were renting. But I was living in their downstairs room, humbled, humbled, humbled. Had a little closet. I used to have the big baller closet. Sold my cars. Had my skateboard still, praise God, and my bike. And a truck, okay? It's all good. But God told me, Sergio, don't focus on what you lost. And I want to say this to you. And I hope this will help someone. Because, man, I know what it is to come to this church, sit over there, broken. And Jason tells me, keep believing, Serge. And this is what I want to tell you. Whatever left you, you don't need it because where God's taking you, you're not going to need what left you. Whatever you lost, you lost it because you really don't need it because what he's about to give you is going to erase the memory of what you lost. Oh God, am I preaching to somebody? I'm preaching to myself. He is faithful. I bought this dream home. I lost my dream home. When it was time for me to buy a house, I said, how am I going to do this, God? I was looking everywhere. And I saw that a friend of mine was selling his house, which was right around the corner where I used to live. And I called him. He said, hey, Serge, come hang out with me. In 20 minutes, because he knew everything that happened to me. He was my neighbor. He goes, oh man, I got an offer, but you know what, Sergio, if you want to buy the house, I'm going to help you. Okay, in 20 minutes, man, it was like he was sent like an angel from God. Okay, let me tell you something. Every person that comes to my house today tells me this, dude, this place is better than your other one. <laughs> Sabes por qué? Because God will turn your problem into your promotion. If they fired you, let it go. God has a better job for you. Man. I'm having a moment right now. He's faithful. I don't care what you lost. Look at me. I know it hurts. I don't care what you lost. You don't need it where you're going. 
but, but how? I'm telling you, say it with me. I don't need it for where I'm going. When the first time my therapist told me that, I wanted to choke him out. Tu ta loco? I'm paying you money to tell me this? Tu ta loco? And you know what he told me? He said, Sergio, you don't realize God is not playing with you. He's really serious about you. I said, I don't feel it. He goes, you're not supposed to because he's stripping you of every mentality that you have that is limiting you from seeing him in a greater way. So I've come from the dead to tell you resurrection power is real. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but your problem is setting you up for your promotion. If you believe that, just give them quick praise. So I'm going to give you what I learned from David's story. Look at what he teaches us. If you're going to praise your way out of your problems, number one, get up from what has knocked you down. Get up from what has knocked you down. Get up. There are things that God can do. But then there are things that you have to do. That might be the best advice you got this week. There are things that God can do for you but they're usually linked to what you do first. I imagine when David was on the dirt, laid out weeping because of his son that just died, that all of his elders were, didn't even know what to say to him. They're like, well, what are we gonna tell him? Because they were so disconnected from him because David seemed crazy to him. Like uh, uh, when a person dies in Jewish culture, they mourn 30 days after. David didn't mourn, he mourned before. So to them, it didn't make sense. But see, David was carrying something different. Until you know who you are and what you carry, you'll sell out in your problem. You'll sell out in the pain. No, you didn't hear what I told you. When you know what you carry and you know how precious it is what you carry, you'll stay in the dirt because it was in the dirt that God met him. And this is how I imagine it went down, okay? David was in the dirt. Everyone was making fun of him because this was the judgment of God, but yet God was next to him in the dirt. And he was sitting there saying, David, how's it going? David, it's not going too well. I mean, I'm, I, I'm broken, I'm done. He goes, oh no, I've come to tell you in the dirt, you're not. What are you doing here, God? Leave me alone. You should just leave me, abandon me. God says, oh no, oh no. I'm gonna live in the dirt with you. And I'm going to stay here. And I'm going to tell you that if you'll praise me through this, I've got a surprise for you. Because I know what you lost. But I know the baby that Bathsheba's about to have. And his name is Solomon. And he's going to be the wisest king who ever walked the earth. And he's going to build what you couldn't build. But David, I know you don't want to get up but I can only help you if you get up. And I can imagine God tells him, David, I'm in the dirt with you, man. I'm not ashamed of you in your dirt, but you can't stay here. So David, all of a sudden, the Bible says he gets up, shocks everyone. And then number two, David washed himself. You've got to cleanse yourself from what happened to you. You gotta wash it off, sister. You gotta let him go. You gotta let her go. You gotta let that situation go. Your spirit cannot be contaminated with the past because your future is way too big. Your future is too big. So when you go to this prosperity conference, I already know what's gonna happen. Your brain's gonna get washed from the poverty mentality. Your spirit's gonna be washed from the from what you lost last year. And God's gonna deposit in your spirit new vision, new power, new life. Come on, somebody. David gets up, cleanses himself, 
And then he anoints himself in front of everyone. He says, none of you are going to anoint me, I know. But when I was 17 and I was anointed, you all were proud of me. But David says, I know none of you are going to anoint me. Because none of you believe in me. But David says, I've been with God in the dirt. He goes, just find me some oil. So David finds some oil. He says, I know none of you believe in me. But there'll come a time where no one else will anoint you. You've got to anoint yourself. You've got to believe in yourself. And you've got to say, if no one else believes in me, I believe I've got an anointing for my generation. I've got an anointing for breakthrough. I've got an anointing to turn hearts. I've got an anointing. David says, I'm going to anoint myself. So I know none of you are going to anoint me. There'll come a time in your life You've got to believe in you. And God's on the other side saying, I can't do it. You've got to do it. But I'm waiting for you over here. So David gets up. David cleanses himself from what happened. He anoints himself. And then the Bible says David changed his clothes. You know what he did? He traded in the old for the new God was doing. Some of you, you've got to go through your closet and say, I'm never going to wear that. I'm never going to wear that. I'm never going to wear that. I'm not going to wear these. I don't need this. Come on, somebody. Listen, listen. The old you cannot go where the new you is gone. And David changes his clothes, symbolically saying, that's it. I'm going forward. Then the Bible says, David went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. See, we read this and it makes sense, but listen, when you are the public national shame because you're the king that committed adultery and everyone knows it, and it cost you your child that you had, donde puedes esconder la cara? Where do you hide your face? And you know what David does? He says, None of you may not want me to go to church because they may not want you to go back to church. They may want you to stay out of church. They may hope that you stay out of church because they may not want you back in the church. But David says, nah, chale, I heard from God. I'm going back to church. I'm going to raise my hands. And whatever the devil says, let him say it. I'm going to praise my God. Whatever the devil's done, let him do it. I'm going to praise my God. I'm going to release it. I'm going to worship. I'm going forward. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. Tell the person next to you, you're not crazy. Tell them you're just called. David comforted his wife Bathsheba later and slept with her and she gave birth to another son named Solomon and the Lord loved Solomon listen listen God already knows what's ahead for you he just needs to know will you worship me first my miracle's on its way your miracle is on its way God just looking for someone. Can somebody praise him today? Stand with me. Stand with me. Job was not exempt from problems. David was not exempt from problems. And they were not exempt from the process. But they made the one most important decision that we all have to make today. Look at me. You have got to make this decision. You've got to decide you're going to serve God. Let me read this to you. Zechariah 3.3 3 says, Just as I've taken away your dirty clothes, I've also taken away your guilt from you, says the Lord. In place of these clothes, I will dress you in pure, expensive garments. Then you will be ready to serve God. You've got to make an exchange with God. You know what happens when 
when you're in dirt after a while, you just get used to it. You just get used to like giving up. But today God wants to say, I got it. I'll do an exchange with you. I'll give you purity back, innocence back, your dignity back. But you got to give me all the dirt. And if you give it to me, no, no, no. He is serious. It's one thing when you're a pastor and you fall. That's shameful, man. Because my whole life is to be a moral example to people. But what do you do when the guy who's supposed to be the example to people fall? Like, where do you hide? Like, you know the demons and the shame I've had to deal with? Like, yes, we're the fastest growing church in America, but just hear the devil and says, yeah, but look at you now, fool. See, eventually you'll have to make that decision. I had to make it. I hope you'll make it with me today to say yes to Jesus, no to your past, and yes to your future. Come on, somebody. Thanks for watching. Stay connected on all of our social media platforms and be sure to subscribe to our channel. Hope you enjoyed today's message. We'll see you soon.